Hello everyone and welcome to Fortiguar Live. This is Douglas Santos and my, I'm, I'm, I am with my great friend Amar Lacani. How are you doing, Amar? I'm good, man. It's been a while since I've seen you like online <laughs> or in person. So it's always, uh, always good to be here, man. Nice. Nice talking to you, man. So today we're going to be talking about our Fortiguar predictions for 2024. I'm pretty sure you saw that content because we review it together and every, every year we stop a little bit what we're doing and we're trying to see what has passed what technologies are here what is happening on the track landscape and you know just try to you know get a little creative and try to understand where we're heading next year you know i i actually love i love our threat predictions i i always wait for them to come out and i, I like working on them because it's it's easy to just go ahead and say things are going to get bad, right? There's going to be more yeah. security problems because, like, like of course, we're, everyone's using technology in ways that they hadn't used before. We're pushing the limits. Mm -hmm. There's more data being used, created, and consumed every day. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so obviously, just from a volume perspective, we we we're going to expect things to increase. But what I like about this is it's we get to kind of put on our our uh, thinking hats and think like, where is technology mm -hmm. going? Where is it going to be most exploitable? And where is it? Where are those exploits going to be most valuable for the bad guys, whether it's nation states or financial crime? Yeah, yeah. And I think what we're seeing right now is uh, every year we have a record number of CVEs, right? So it's just it's just that it, we we don't see any 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 year that it's gonna oh you know, in twenty twenty four we're gonna have less CV years than twenty twenty three. I don't I don't see that happening just because you know there's way more uh, vulnerability researchers doing their work, you know, uh, vendors such as Fortinet do have their own zero day program. So more and more, we're going to have those vulnerabilities popping up. And I mean, cybercrime in nation state will obviously be looking for those zero days as well. Right. So it is it is uh, something that should always be uh, in the in the crosshairs of those of those guys who want to leverage those vulnerabilities to create cyber weapons, right? So obviously, adversaries will always discover new ways to compromise uh, networks. But carrying on attacks has never been so easier, right? So we do have a lot of automation and and machine learning technologies that these guys are are way faster than the the normal organization to leverage those right because they don't have standards to follow they don't have you know uh procedures like so they, they obviously function in a, in a in a lot of sense like the usual organization but they don't have the restraints and the and the how can i say the the procedural and the industry regulations that they need to follow so they can just get AI and quickly incorporate it into the playbook. So today, what we're seeing well, today already in 2023, but in 2024 and going forward, is that attackers will more and more have a easy button to like launch an attack. And I would like to, to explore a little bit about, about that, how, how you see uh, that specific easiness of attacks uh, and how, how should we respond to that? Yeah, no. So let me let me let me take a step back of what I had traditionally seen. Right, I had seen ancient states, uh, you know, take a very very long and slow approach, and they were very really mm -hmm. successful at that. They spent a lot of time on reconnaissance uh, with their target, you know, with their target victims. Uh, they spent a lot of time, like actually uh, doing, uh, in a, in a, you know, getting into the systems, uh, you know, um, doing reconnaissance inside the systems, expanding uh, within the organization, and then figuring out what data was valuable who the targets were, and then slowly getting that data out. A lot of that usually was custom code, right? It was like whether they created it, uh, you know, in uh, you know whatever programming language or custom development, uh, you know, environment they wanted to do. On the flip side, what we started seeing is on the on the cyber crime side uh, is we started seeing this evolution of script kitties, basically using known programs to cyber crime actors now using a lot of open source projects, maybe even some commercial tools, modifying that, uh, getting into systems and modifying the code. Uh, a lot of times, plenty of times to start evading security and maybe even adding a little bit of customization themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing, uh, seeing these two groups get closer and closer together. 
especially with AI, with other tools and resources, and with how easy it is to modify these modify code. And uh, now you don't have to create that custom code to really have something sophisticated. You can actually take something th that existed, even though it may be well known, it may be caught that every vendor is catching it. At this point, you can still modify it enough. And there's enough tools, like especially with AI, especially with um, you know other types of programming resources out there. Uh, mm -hmm. A little bit of research even on Stack Overflow will give you probably enough knowledge to uh, get some code modified in a way that, you know, will abate a lot of security. And because of that, because of how easy it is to evade security, we're not seeing this need for custom code to be released. I'm sure it's still being created in many ways, but there's no reason for nation states or even other cyber criminals if they have custom code or zero day to, to essentially burn them because the old stuff is working really, really well just with a little bit of modification. Exactly, yes. And uh, it's, it's interesting to see how they are quickly to to use those technologies, right? We're seeing one of the first instances where I saw their, them using AI, uh, specifically LLM, was to generate more convincing phishing emails, right? <laughs> so there's no <laughs> there's no grammar or syntax errors at all. So they're really uh, they're really pushing the bar on this, and uh, it, it it this makes me think of um, of something that you know. Cybercrime and nation state, they, they, they power up, right? So it's an adversary, they're powering up. And uh, we as cyber defenders, we need to be able to power up as well, right? So just a simple example, if attackers are now using LLMs to craft very convincing emails, now the phishing training sh shouldn't, shouldn't uh, point to the fact that, oh, if there is a grammar error, it's most likely phishing because this is most likely going to disappear, right? And yeah, I, I really, I really like that. You're right. So uh, usually, you know, we we um, and, and there's a whole study on like some of the grammar mistakes are actually on mm -hmm. purpose as well on uh, on why attackers may do that. We can talk a uh, we can talk a lot about that as well. But but you're mm -hmm. right. We usually tell people to look for grammar mm -hmm. mistakes and or other types of common mistakes to mm -hmm. go ahead and uh, find phishing attacks. Obviously, that that bar is uh, is going away essentially right uh, ai is going to take care of that because it can write very convincing emails i mean i i hate to say it i actually have to write an apology letter to uh, to a friend of mine <laughs> just uh, you, you know and uh, and i uh, you know i'm not really good at apology letters so i told ai i basically told chat gpt hey can you write this and uh, my friend said like you definitely didn't write that because that sounds a lot nicer than what you would ever write to me yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was like, okay, that's that's kind of cool, but it's the same way. Like the those phishing emails, the bar is essentially going away. Yeah. Um, on top of that, it's much more like a lot of these. Uh, you know, OpenAI has safeguards. Google, Microsoft, they all have safeguards to try and uh, make sure that they don't generate anything malicious. But mm -hmm. there's ways around that. There's like basically chat prompting and chat, yeah. hack, chat hacking, like asking it, uh, you know, pieces of information and then putting it together. Um, and on top of that, you can take your own open source AI, yeah, yeah. like uh, you know, GPT, and exactly. generate it with your own learning models and attacks and get something very customizable very fast now. It doesn't take supercomputers yeah. and years and years of training to do that. So uh, you can start, certainly start creating your own code and actually mm -hmm. ask it to write something malicious. Um, you yeah. know, using a couple of uh, open open source tools, I was able to, in different pieces, uh, essentially write an attack of, uh, you know, looking for specific Office documents, scanning mm -hmm. the system for Office documents, embedding that into graphic files using Stego. And uh, so basically taking a legitimate file and putting it behind a graphics file and then mm -hmm. transferring that file. And if anyone evaluated that or looked at that, they, they would uh, uh, they would actually just, just see a graphics file. Now I got this I got this idea from another researcher uh, that actually had done it publicly at a talk. So I just recreated that, but it worked and it, it worked mm -hmm. really well. I'm thinking like, wow, uh, uh, you know, what, what else can we think of, right? To do yeah. these type of attacks. It wasn't, wasn't really what I would call a zero day attack, but no. it definitely worked, you know? And I, like I said, mine was a proof of concept. Just imagine if I was actually malicious or if the original researcher was malicious, what they could have done with that. Yeah, there's so much things to to do. I mean, uh, it, I gotta say, it, it must be very very exciting being an attacker these days because the, the sheer number of, of things you can do, you know, it's just mind blowing. Just yesterday, I was watching YouTube and I saw a, a video of Brad Gardenhouse, the CEO of XRP, uh, saying that if you say if you send specific amount on XRP. 
you will receive a double back. And it's obviously a scam. And it is obvious that they did uh, a deep fake of him uh, with his voice, you know, actually moving his mouth as he spoke about this, this scam. And I was like, wow, this is so well done. And it's, it's being propagated, right? And, and if you are naive enough to know that, uh, you know, <laughs> Brad Garninghouse would not be doing this, right? It's not sustainable. If you send like 10 XRP and get 20 back, how does it even work? But the, the visuals are so compelling that I, I'm pretty sure this, 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 uh, this is getting them a lot of money. And it's it's weird to think that we're we're living in an era where it's it's hard to tell uh, fake from real, right? It's 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 at least with the naked eye, right? So it's it's very interesting times. Another thing that I wanted to bring up with you is that uh, we're seeing uh, that we're entering in a new era of that's called advanced persistent cybercrime, where cybercrime and nation state APTs, which I know I don't know two one two years ago there were really distinct uh, organizations and and, and 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 objectives if we can really say that and now we're starting to see that they are they're blurring their lines right so they're feeding off of each other's strengths uh, you do you like to talk a little bit more about that what do you think about this new era of advanced persistent cybercrime. Yeah, so uh, you know, it's I, I think we kind of kind of touched on it a little bit. Is mm -hmm. that we're, we're we're seeing this like merger, like uh, you know, nation states are uh, you know spending a lot more time as, long, as along with uh, you know the criminal financial uh, groups, uh, cyber financial groups, uh, mm -hmm. basically merging the time they're spending on reconnaissance. They're actually mm -hmm. like looking at, hey, like how do I get into an organization? What's the most successful way of getting into an organization? They're using the same tools that they, uh, you know, both organizations do. It doesn't really matter the end goal if they're, you know, trying to do a nation state attack or if they're really really at the end, you know, trying to do some sort of ransomware attack or something else. But uh, they're using the same tools at the very end. And we're seeing mm -hmm. that merger. Um, as I said before, we used to see very, very different and distinct uh, attack patterns, attack mm -hmm. languages, programs and tools being used uh, throughout, a, throughout a whole incident between the two different groups. And now it's hard to tell. You just can't tell by by looking at, um, you know, the, the attack patterns or the tools or uh, even even who they're attacking, whether it's nation state or whether it's uh, a cyber crime mm -hmm. actor. Uh, it could be either one. Uh, and in many cases, the uh, we're starting to see this merger of like like talent and people going from cyber mm -hmm. crime to nations to getting recruited by nation states and vice versa as well. Yeah, I think I think that in the in the very end of their organization, there are developers, right? So developers that are looking for exploit, that are writing malicious code, they might work for both organizations as well, right? So I think this is something uh, that is expected, obviously. And uh, but unfortunately, unfortunately for our defenders, this is only the tip of the iceberg, right? Because we saw on our Global Threat Landscape report for the first half of 2023 that we witnessed uh, significant activity among APT groups. So at any given point in time, we saw that about 30% of all categorized uh, APT groups and cybercrime groups throughout history were active on that time. So, I mean, that means that uh, more than ever, at very advanced attacks are trying to breach our organization's defenses, right? So we saw Turla, Strong PD, uh, WinNTI, NTI, Ocean Lotus were the most active, right? So I think that looking forward, uh, we predict that more of those APT groups will, will rise from this dormant state, right? And I think this is driven a lot by uh, the current geopolitical landscape that we're living in with wars breaking up and geopolitical tensions rising in the globe. So uh, I think that it is time for uh, organizations to really, you know, take a step back and really uh, reassess their cyber defenses against uh, the most uh, prolific attackers, right? So I think this is, this is a time for, for us to really get uh, get a really very 
the detailed gap analysis of where our defenses stand and fare against those uh, newest attacks, right? Yeah, so Douglas, I think you actually made a really good point is like when you talk about these um, nation state attackers, you're talking about the APT groups, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like we, we kind of name these groups to to threat actors, but we're not, we're not, if you think about what we're doing is we're not really naming who APT28 is, we're naming a collection of activities, right? Yeah. When we think APT28 or a, whatever group we're talking about, we're talking about like activities that they do, like, hey, initial access, this is their techniques, uh, mm -hmm. hey, persistent, uh, you know, being persistent in the system, these are their techniques, whatever, mm -hmm. how they, uh, you know, take data out of an organization, these are their techniques. And, and those techniques are being recycled over and over again, and we're seeing mm -hmm. the volume increase on those techniques, absolutely. Yes. And, and as you said, as you just mentioned, is it's a good time to because those techniques are being kind of ripped apart from mm -hmm. one one attack group and being used over and over again by multiple groups. So it's definitely a good time to check to see like, hey, mm -hmm. um, can I protect against not only can I protect against this technique, that's that's the mm -hmm. best thing, right? Make sure you're yeah. stopping the technique, but can you also detect it? Can you respond mm -hmm. against that? Yeah. And what is your playbook if you are, uh, you, know, you know, if those techniques are successful against mm -hmm. your organization? You know, what is yeah. your incident response plan? So uh, uh, so I think that's that's absolutely a good and valid point. Mm -hmm. and, and as you said, I think we're going to see a lot more of that, more of that in 2024 mm -hmm. with, uh, yeah. with AI decoupling those techniques into new attacks or more mm -hmm. custom attacks. Yeah, another another statistic that we saw on the Global Threat Landscape Report, and I think it's tied to that activity, uh, or, or that APT activity, is that we saw that roughly two thirds of all categorized minor attack techniques were actively being used in attacks. And if you think about that for a second, that's a lot because, uh, at least from from what I remember, we have five hundred plus techniques in minor attack. And on those 500 plus techniques, there's a possibly an infinite way of implementing a specific technique in a procedural way, right? So although MITRE has done a great job in, you know, making threat, hunter, threat hunting more, uh, let's say, more effective, if you don't prioritize according to what is actually, what, what the techniques uh, threat actors are actually using, then you're, you're no good than, than hunting for hashes and IOCs, right? So it is really important to understand which techniques are actually being used and leverage that to your security operations, right? Your purple teaming, your, your, your detection engineering, and your threat hunting, right? So uh, uh, I think that this is, this is a very good place to start, right? So we have a couple of resources on FortiGuard that are available to, to customers and partners that map the TTP profile uh, of, um, of industry and regional so that you have a categorized and prioritized list to drive that specific response and detection engineering from your... Yeah, I, I actually like mapping TTPs to mm -hmm. industry attacks better than to individual attackers because mm -hmm. to me that's, that's more... That's more. Uh, if I'm on the defensive side, that's more mm -hmm. uh, what I can focus on. I can say, hey, this, is, this is where are the bad guys are coming after, like all my colleagues, uh, all mm -hmm. my competitors, probably me as well. And can mm -hmm. I can I detect and can I respond against that? And of course, uh, can I protect against those initial attacks? Awesome, awesome, Amar. Uh, thank you for your time, and I think this was a very uh, productive and interesting discussion. I I think uh, that. Um, this is a very good, uh, uh, like, it's very good uh, resume of what we summary of what we 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 did on the predictions, and I uh, and I thank you for your participation. Hey man, it's always always good to be here. Thank you so much, man. I thank you guys. Have a good one.